Hello, everyone, and welcome again, and good morning, good afternoon from all over the world, and uh, uh, people that are watching us from every single corner around the world, we're happy to have you back at the Global Marathon for the Global Implantology Summit. And uh, today we're very excited, and uh, we have Dr. Ehab Rashid all the way from the land of the pharaohs, and uh, he's uh, originally from Egypt, and he's practicing in Dubai. Uh, he studied a lot in Germany, and uh, we're very excited to have him today, and we're very excited to be back with you, and with a lot of interesting topics, a lot of uh, cases, different perspectives and views. And... Uh, I'm going to just uh, let you know a little bit about uh, Dr. Rashid's bio, and then we're going to talk about more and more uh, about who he is and what got him interested in all this uh, implant world. Um, Dr. Ehab Rashid is uh, practicing in the, uh, Dubai. Uh, I have been uh, more than 24 years of experience in dentistry. He's uh, obtained his Bachelor of Oral Surgery and Dental Medicine from Cairo University. He's holding a Diplomate of Oral Implantology from Freiburg University, Germany. He's MSc from Münster University in Germany. He joined the uh, United Arab Emirates government and in Dental Hospital in 1990 as a general practitioner, started his private clinic in 1996. In 1998, Dr. Ehab completed successfully his uh, dental implant certificate from uh, Freitag Dental Implant Center in Mannheim, Germany under the supervision of Dr. Khoury uh, and Professor Kirsch. 1999, he finished his surgical and prosthetic certificate in oral implantology under supervision of Dr. Richard. Dr. Ehab received his uh, certificate in implant surgical procedure and prosthetic aspect uh, by Professor Niklas Bern University in Switzerland. Dr. Ehab joined the International Federation of Aesthetic Dentistry and the European Academy of Aesthetic Dentistry by the recommendation of Dr. Mauro Fradiani, and Dr. Rehab received his certificate in complex surgical uh, restorative procedure in oral implantology from Stuttgart, Germany. Uh, he received his certificate in soft tissue management in Germany by Dr. Professor Khoury. Uh, he advanced surgical procedure with bone augmentation from Professor Khoury, and he's also a diplomate by the ICI and an expert of the DGI. Uh, he has been placing dental implants along with bone grafting and soft tissue reconstruction to replace missing teeth since 1998. He's one of the pioneers in aesthetic dentistry in Dubai and has been involved in aesthetic and corrective treatment since 1997. He keeps updating his skills, latest technologies such as digital dentistry, CAD CAM, microscopic dentistry, and a lot of other um, digital advancements and smile design. Uh, welcome, Dr. Rashid. How are you? Dr. Rashid is a good friend as well, and um, uh, we're very excited to know more about you personally than anything else. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for having me. It's a great pleasure to be with you guys. I've been seeing uh, the great uh, effort that you've been doing uh, since this COVID-19 uh, thing happening, and uh, you have lots of great speakers around the world. It's a great effort to keep everyone entertained and uh, updating their information. So it's a quite useful uh, platform for people to update their knowledge and uh, see different parts of the uh, world uh, kind of uh, uh, skills and the techniques and treatment. So it's a good way to, to be global, actually being with you in this platform. We're very happy to have you, doctor. What got you interested in the world of implants as a start? Well, uh, when I finished university uh, in the late 80s and uh, I attended a conference, it was uh, related to implantology and uh, I was very impressed that uh, uh, this kind of uh, treatment that you can provide to the patient and change their life, especially where people have a full denture. And then yeah. you can see that uh, within a couple of months they can have uh, fixed teeth and they can have their life in a normal way. So it was a quite uh, interesting thing for me, and I started going into these uh, things and uh, searching and uh, studying, and uh, this is how I get into it. And then I started doing these implants in the uh, early 90s, and uh, I found it more interesting, and uh, I became more hooked on this kind of field. 
So that was the beginning, uh, how to get into dental implantology. Yep, we have been uh, seeing tons of uh, hundreds of thousands of followers on YouTube and tons of surgeries. Now you can do the surgeries in your sleep. I can sense that. So yeah. <laughs> you've been doing it for a very long time. Uh, one of your hobbies, I know, is car racing as well, which uh, comes along perfectly with uh, what we do. With <laughs> a lot of excitement here, a lot of excitement there, and uh, lots of precision. <laughs> yep, and uh, skateboarding in your luxurious apartment and stealing some kids' skateboard. Yeah, <laughs> actually, uh, the video I had earlier was uh, my uh, my niece and nephew just bought a brand new uh, skateboard, so I was just, uh, trying it. You stole it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Perfect. And your like um, all your experience from Cairo University all the way to Germany to some uh, British and American education and uh, experience. How do you see the difference between different perspectives and uh, in doing implants and surgeries? Actually, you know, at the beginning of uh, going into the field of this implantology, I was uh, attending different conferences and I could see that. Uh, the, the dental implant field was quite advanced in Germany. This is why I chose to get my speciality there and uh, it is more accessible to me than uh, like uh, being in uh, North America because of the flight distance, everything. But also I noticed that in Germany, there's lots of uh, studies and research and uh, uh, the, the field was quite advanced that time when I started to join this kind of uh, treatment. So uh, my first choice was just to get my uh, training done in Germany and uh, get mo most of my uh, clinical experience in Germany. That's why I decided to uh, join courses there and get my uh, master's degree there as well. Yeah, you picked some of the best universities and some of the most experienced clinicians to, to start off with and uh, mix them all together to, yeah. to let you know about everything. Uh, we're very excited and we're very happy to listen to your lecture today and i love the name of the topic where did we go wrong and we learn more from the mistakes of the surgery rather than just standardizing and knowing everything uh, the more we see of failures the more we see of different diversity of the way of doing things the more you can grasp uh, have a better grip on everything and a better yeah. understanding <clears throat> we're very excited to listen to the lecture today and uh, uh and uh if you would like to start it, uh, would love to okay. go from there. Uh, actually, this patient is uh, uh, is uh, 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 the patient about the topic today is is a, is a good uh, friend of mine, and his son had the missing tooth, and uh, I know this boy since he was a little uh, kid, and. Uh, he was a very naughty child, and uh, we'll, we're just going to see how how uh, the treatment was done and everything. And uh, something went wrong in the treatment, and I wanted to know what did I do wrong. If you look at these cases here, this is a case that I've seen on the uh, internet. And these cases, you see that the uh, uh, every single parameter is done is not a correct. It's the depth of the implant in a wrong position. Uh, the 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 uh, buccolingual direction is in wrong position as well. You can also see the implant diameter is quite wide. So this is lots of mistakes done in this case, and uh, uh, we would like to avoid this kind of problems. Something like this as well. This is something that due to uh, uh, wrong planning of the case and. Uh, but sometimes you do everything correct and then something goes wrong. So we have to understand what we do wrong and what we do uh, uh, due to improper treatment. You see, this is a bad planning of the case. You have a narrow area and two implants very close to each other, and also a very thin uh, mucosa, plus also uh, the position of the implant to buckle the, the direction and the uh, dimension of the implant itself is quite wide. So there is lots of mistakes that's done in this kind of cases, and uh, no wonder they failed in that way. So. We're going to go into my case and see exactly, even though you can do lots of uh, great planning and the study of the case and you have a good experience and then something goes wrong at the end. But I want to know exactly 
What did I do wrong in the case that have this kind of uh, complication? Uh, something that I always do when I do any case, I always take pictures for every step I do. Uh, this is quite useful because if something goes in the way that you don't want it to go, you can come back to the pictures and see what did you do wrong exactly. Because during surgery, we are under the pressure of finalizing the work. Uh, the patient is uh, like uh, in a hurry to uh, finish the situation because as we all know, no one likes coming to the dentist and being in the dental chair and having a surgery done on them, like doing a flab and bleeding and nurses and all the things. So it's a quite a complicated kind of a situation that you want to end it as quick as possible. So sometimes you miss a step or a, a you do something in a way that you shouldn't do and you can create a complication later on and that's why i like to always take pictures of what i do to see what did i do or where did i went wrong so this is the case that i will discuss today with you you can see this case it's a lower central incisor that this small boy uh when he was cycling and playing around, he he hit his uh, uh, lower center incisor and uh, cracked it. He went to the emergency room in some hospital and they had to extract the tooth because it was unrestorable and it was fractured. So this boy had a, a, a long-term uh, kind of uh, bridge that Maryland cemented to the adjacent teeth for all nearly all his life till he came to the clinic. And this boy always didn't like this kind of... Uh, crown and he wanted to change it to have an implant because nowadays you see everyone go online and read things and go on the youtube and you could see that he can have a tooth back on his implant uh, like a normal tooth so he requested his dad and his father actually one of the big uh, uh, cosmetic surgeons here in uh, in dubai so he contacted me and he said to me well we need to come along and have a look and uh, we've been uh, to many clinics and everyone said to us it's a quite uh, a difficult case because the bone is quite thin and uh, it's a quite complicated case. The another challenge was in this case that this uh, young boy, he's actually a young man now, he's not a boy anymore. He was studying a university in another country. So we had a time limitation that he has to come, do the treatment and he fly back. So he was not really available at the city where I'm living uh, for a long time. He's coming only for a holiday uh, just to do the treatment and go back. So we have lots of limitation of the treatment that I have to uh, uh, optimize outcome. I have to finalize the case in uh, not a long period of time. I have to also make sure that the case uh, stay well because this patient does not live in the same city I am. So there was always traveling and coming and going. So all these consideration has to be taken in mind during the planning. So uh, we uh, checked the x-ray of the patient and you could saw that they have a very thin ridge as you can see here and this is how the case looks like when you take an, a, a buccal view of the case you see have a nice uh, healthy uh, dentition and uh, quite a big amount of soft tissue at the side but you can see that they have a big frenum uh, attached to the uh, uh, mucosa here on the buccal side and uh, i have to uh, consider this in my treatment because i know that i have to uh, do kind of what we call it uh, phrenectomy just to release uh, this frenum and i have to uh, release it before i start doing my surgery because i'm planning to augment the site so this is something that i did i released the freedom on that direction as you can see here and then we started elevating the uh, mucosa uh, gently after doing a, a, a flap on the crest and uh, i extended the flap as you can see to uh, two to three uh, teeth on the adjacent side on the uh, buccal side. So everything is flapped in a way that uh, we can elevate the flap nicely and I expose the side to see how much uh, bone and how much defect that we have. If you look at the side here, we elevated the uh, flap in a really uh, good way to just to uh, have a proper exposure at the site and uh, on the occlusal view you can see that we have a very narrow ridge uh, from the uh, lingual to the buccal direction so the site here is quite narrow and i can see that uh, this uh, ridge is not enough to have a tooth uh, i mean sorry to have an implant at the site so i have to consider augmenting on the buccal side as well as the uh, lingual side so that was my plan of treatment that i have to place my implant i have to augment on the buccal side and also augment on the lingual side to have adequate amount of uh, ridge at the site 
And this is my uh, uh, position uh, that I have to place my implant at this uh, area, uh, keeping in mind that this implant should have enough amount of bone to the uh, distal uh, side and the mesial side, and I have to keep a distance uh, of about one. Uh, 0.5 to 2 millimeter to the adjacent teeth in order to create a papilla at the end of the treatment. So we move with the case, uh, the implant, it was inserted at the site. As you can see that the implant is quite exposed from the buccal side as well as the lingual side. We used in this case a three uh, millimeter diameter implant, which is a quite narrow diameter implant. And I maintained the enough amount of the uh, bone it peaks on the uh, either third of the implant uh, between the uh, adjacent teeth because I want to create a nice papilla at that side. And you can see the implant threads are all exposed. The uh, dimension that I placed my implant at that area uh, in, in, a, in a good way so that I make sure that the uh, uh, result will come to the uh, uh, proper way that I wanted to have. In this case, I'm going to start having uh, what we call it a sticky bone, as you can see on the top of the screen. We're going to have a, a PRF membrane. I'm going to have a titanium uh, meshes and screws to stabilize the mesh. We can also have a collagen membrane that will be later on immersed at the patient growth factors that uh, this will all enhance the soft tissue healing. So we did everything we can do to create a proper case uh, at least to success. The bone was mixed with the plasma full of uh, growth factors. The uh, collagen membrane, which is uh, 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 slow resorbing collagen membrane and we created also the PRF from the patient plasma to make sure that the soft tissue heal nicely and at the same time I want to create a good cage for the uh, uh, bone cells to grow so I will use these uh, titanium meshes and also it has to be stabilized with these screws so everything that we want to uh, think about we have to uh, place it together and then Put everything. So we come back to the case here. We see that we use a quite a thick uh, collagen membrane that it does not fold. You can see that we use the uh, bone tags to uh, screw the membrane at the site because I want to maintain the uh, membrane in position. I don't want to have any kind of mobility or anything that moves at that area because if we have any motion or any kind of micro motion at the site, we can lead, uh, lead the case release to a failure. So I want to make sure that everything is stable, nothing moves, everything is like supported nicely with the rigid uh, fixation. So if you look at the occlusal view here, we can see that uh, the uh, area was grafted on the uh, buccal side with a sticky bone, as well as the uh, lingual side also with a sticky bone. And you see the bone is not scattered and we kind of created a proper form of the ridge as uh, you can see that we planned at the beginning we created the uh, proper envelope of bone and the implant is placed in a proper way and i augmented uh, uh, more than three millimeter on the buccal side because i consider the amount of resorption that can, might happen at the site so everything done as the book say uh, everything is uh, uh, planned in a way and uh, uh, or our plan uh, steps has been implemented at the case you can see that the implant position in a correct way the bone grafted in the buccal wall and the palatal wall uh, it's quite stable is not moving is not scattered you can see the blood circulating at the site so we have enough blood coming to the site and you can see also we have a big amount of uh, uh, collagen uh, thick membrane that will cover the total area and on the top of that I have to make sure that I have to maintain the site for the bone cells to grow because I don't want to uh, crush this bone cells and bone particles that I augmented at the site and actually this particles of bone is like a, a mix of autogenous and uh, uh, xenograft so we collected a uh, bone from the retromolar area and then we mix it with the uh, bovine bone to create the sticky bone because i want to uh, have an istio osteoinductive cells which is the natural bone cells from the uh, patient and uh, osteo Con, uh, osteo uh, conductive cell that the uh, bovine bone that they get from the from the uh, uh, that we get. And then we go back to the site here, we see that we have to maintain the shape uh, of the uh, defect because I want to make sure that the size of the defect is not shrink after the uh, placing the after placing our uh, our uh, uh, bone graft and covering the side with the flap. So we place two titanium meshes, as you can see, one on the lingual side and already pre-curved and one on the buccal side also pre-curved, as you can see. And the, the, the titanium mesh, as you can see, they have lots of uh, holes to allow for the uh, vascularization and the blood to circulate at the site. And now we have to stabilize 
all the uh, titanium mesh by uh, placing the uh, screw on the top uh, on the implant to hold the uh, titanium mesh properly and make sure that it's all uh, stable and not moving and then after we've done this and uh, screwed at the bottom as well we can uh, now uh, cover the area with the collagen membrane as you can see the membrane is shaped to the defect side and uh, will be covered all together after that we come back to the site and uh, we take the PRF from the patient that we centrifuge from the patient and then we lay it on the top of the uh, collagen membrane. We want to make sure that everything is covered nicely and we have adequate amount of growth factors and uh, nice vital cells that will circulate at the site to enhance the healing properly. So I did everything I can to make sure uh, make sure that everything is like uh, placed in a correct way. And uh, uh, this kind of uh, material that we use to maximize out the outcome on the on the case. Uh, as you can see, the uh, uh, flab was released properly. The area was sutured where I did the uh, phrenectomy at the beginning. And then everything is pulled together. And then you can see that I released a big amount of soft tissue on the buccal side. Please take notes of this uh, area where they did the phrenectomy because as you can see that the phrenectomy is done in a way that uh, uh, I, I, I thinned the soft tissue. This is the one mistake that I did. The way that I did the phrenectomy it was too close to the flap and I thinned the flap on the buccal side. I should have gone a little bit more buccally to be away from the soft tissue that will cover the, uh, the, uh, the, the defect. So everything is uh, sutured properly, as you can see, with the horizontal mattress suture, also interrupted suture, and you can see everything uh, covered totally, and everything looks quite uh, stable, and I had one releasing incision only on one side, because I didn't want to uh, interrupt the blood supply to the side, so we did only one vertical releasing incision that extend beyond the mucogenital junction on the far distal side of the uh, uh, canine. So we move on with the case and then uh, the patient called me after a few weeks and called me and said to me there is something showing at the site. Uh, I'm going to take a picture and send it to you. And the patient was uh, coming back to uh, Dubai, the city where I practice, and I said to him just uh, uh, maintain the area uh, clean with uh, as much as you can till you come back and you'll see and then uh, when the patient come back to the clinic we found this kind of uh, uh, situation as you can see here I can see that the area is uh, exposed. We had uh, uh, exposure of the uh, membrane titanium mesh on the lingual side and the flap was open as you can see here. And uh, if you think why this happened, actually we did everything that we can do in a way to uh, release the area to cover everything. But obviously I did a mistake of not releasing enough. And then we can see that this exposure due to the tension that can happen after the healing. You see all the soft tissue has rolled to uh, the lingual side away from the uh, titanium mesh and it's exposed now. So now we are in the dilemma, what can we do now? This is just after a few weeks about six weeks from the time of pressing the implant. So everything is like uh, still at the critical healing stage. So what would I do in this case? Shall I uh, open everything, remove everything, or just await, or what can I do exactly? So um, I decided to uh, take it easy and just uh, uh, go slow with the uh, site and handle every uh, symptoms that appear at the site. So we clean the site well with lots of chloroxidine and irrigate a lot, and we inform the patient to keep everything clean, and this is how the site looks like after cleaning, the bright everything. And I could see this titanium mesh is exposed and the soft tissue is totally shrunk at the site. One good thing that I always do when I use titanium mesh because it has a high rate of exposure, we always have to use a big amount of uh, autogenous bone, patient on bone, because the patient on bone will uh, uh, be identified to the soft tissue that this area has to be covered with the epithelium so what we can do at this uh, minute that just clean the site i asked the patient to go back to his university he flew back to his city and you clean the site well everything stayed clean and the wish it has to come back after one one month so we go back after uh, one month of the patient return and uh, we ask myself that time what did i do wrong in that site if we look at this uh, kind of uh, 
if you look at this kind of uh, position, uh, we can understand something that if you see that there is uh, something called the uh, blade number one that I usually use, and this is to uh, cut the uh, site. And then when, when I use this blade, just to make sure that I use it on the crystal incision. And this incision is totally uh, uh, isolated from any other incision. It goes into the uh, crystal area. And then we go into the uh, sulcus. Also, if you need to do uh, extension, we always do a vertical incision that comes away from the uh, defect area. It has to also uh, pass beyond the uh, mucogingival junction. Uh, as you can see here and then we have to do another incision which is called the uh, releasing incision that will be done in the preostium and she it should extend beyond the uh, crystal incision so this is the first mistake i did that i did not extend my preostium incision more than the crystal incision and also at the same time uh, when i placed my uh, bone graft uh, um, on the lingual side, I did not release enough. I did not extend my uh, incision enough to the uh, each side of the uh, defect. So this is what happened as well, that I did not uh, elevate enough uh, flab on the lingual side. And the lingual flab was not uh, longer than the buccal flab as well. This is something very, very important as well. When you do a lingual flab, you should extend it more than the buccal flab. This is something that I didn't do. I uh, kept the lingual flap uh, the same dimension as the buccal flap. And that was the major factor for exposure on the lingual side. So this is uh, why this has all happened. And the patient come back to us after uh, one month of going back to the university. When you come back, I see that the site is still kind of uh, healing it looks uh, not as bad as the first time the patient come but now i can see that these this mesh exposed uh, is preventing the soft tissue to heal so i have to do something about this now we passed the uh, critical stage now the patient nearly more than uh, two months so uh, i know that this uh, the, the healing is maturing at the site so what i have to do now i have to cut this titanium mesh in a way and i mean cut because i remember at the beginning i screw it to the implant so if i try to unscrew the cover screw i have the possibility of losing my implant so what i'm going to do now in this kind of case i have to get a very sharp uh, bear that i have to cut the uh, titanium mesh at the uh, uh, implant cover screw area to make sure that I don't unscrew the uh, cover screw. So this is what we did and uh, a case we removed the area that we cut it here as you can see here because I didn't want to unscrew the cover screw and uh, cleaned everything and, and let the patient go home in that way. As you can see that the 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 area is still uh, bleeding now my intention is to have uh, closure at the site these bone particles were like worrying me because this is a bovine bone that's still not totally modified but i can see that there's enough blood supply at the site and then i leave it to heal and the patient went back to the university and then this is how it looks at the time of the visit and the patient come back after nearly uh, two months uh, looking like this so we see that we created uh, just a nice area for the closure of the soft tissue and i know that the uh, uh, titanium mesh was the one causing the interrupting and, uh, of the of the soft tissue to grow at the site so you can see here the uh, the edge of the uh, titanium mesh that I cut with my bear, it's still connected to the cover screw of the implant because I could not unscrew it at that time. And then everything uh, healed well. And I know that I maneuvered the case and uh, uh, maintained my uh, uh, implant. The patient come back after one month later, and this is what I get, another exposure on the buccal side. And if you notice that this exposure is uh, was at the site where I did my phrenectomy. So my phrenectomy was the reason to thin the uh, tissue at the site and leads to exposure of the titanium mesh. I wanted to keep the uh, whole site intact as it is, but I can see that this titanium mesh has a, a, a kind of a penetration of the soft tissue under the titanium mesh because I work a lot with microscope. I look through the microscope, I could see that the all these little circle and holes had the soft tissue invasion underneath because the I mentioned at the beginning that the when you use autogenous bone, uh, the 
the uh, uh, the natural cells of the body will identify each other so the soft tissue you know that this is an exposed bone from the same patient so it will grow above it and cover it and that's why we like to use a lot of autogenous bone from the patient at the sites of the graft especially when we use a titanium mesh so now i have this problem that i have enough amount of retinized tissue around the neck of the implant if you go more to the mucogingival junction where i exactly did my phrenectomy because i did it too close to the uh, flab, I thinned the area and the area became more vulnerable to be exposed and this is what happened exactly. Exposure was done. So now what I have to do, I have to remove this uh, exposed area of the titanium mesh and let uh, the uh, soft tissue heal. I did not remove all the mesh because the healing is still not totally matured and I don't want to lose also the keratinized area. So what I'm going to do as well, I'm going to do exactly the same thing. I'm going to get a very thin uh, diamond bear and exactly cut the exposed area of the titanium mesh. We'll leave the rest of the mesh at the side here. As you can see here, everything is, uh, this is, uh, I'm showing you at the site where I did my phrenectomy, and this is exactly at the same site where we have the uh, exposure. So uh, the, the uh, titanium mesh was cut, as I mentioned earlier, with a blade, uh, sorry, with the, uh, a very fine bear, and then it was removed from the site and we leave everything to heal. And this is how the patient looked like after just a few weeks of healing. You see, everything looks really nice and thick healing and everything looks quite well. But I'm still not 100% satisfied with the soft tissue at that area because I want to create more thick tissue at the site because it was a quite big augmentation area. And I know that when I did the vernectomy, see the site healed well after removing the titanium mesh, but I want to increase the thickness of the soft tissue because I want a long-term, this patient in his early 20s, I want to have a long-term success of the case. So uh, the patient would advise to come back after the healing was totally matured. And then now I have to look at the site here, nicely healed. Now I have to increase the thickness of the uh, soft tissue on the buccal side. And how we do this, we're gonna see how we do this now because I want to handle my situation. I have to, I need to get a connective tissue graft from the palate and then place it and then we'll see how to do this. So we measure the site at the area we need to increase the thickness of the soft tissue and then we go to the palate and uh, uh, mark it in the exact dimension and then we do the incision that I like to do one incision only because I want to minimize the trauma to the patient. We do one incision graft and then release and take the connective tissue as you can see here i need a thick area thick tissue as you can see here quite thick tissue and i have to now augment it at the site to thicken so this is uh, the part of the soft tissue that i created from the uh, uh, second incision flap at the uh, palate you can see that i did a, a kind of uh, a tunnel because I don't want to expose the whole area. I tunnel a little bit away from the uh, site and I keep a uh, very superficial of the soft tissue to release the tunnel. I don't get close to the augmented bone site because I don't want to damage the a new bone because it's still maturing. And then uh, the acrylic tissue is placed and sutured in position and I suture the uh, tunnel incision as you can see here that I did away from the graft site and then you can also see that I stabilized the uh, graft at a coronal portion also as well as the uh, buccal area to make sure that it does not skid and move to the uh, direction that I do want it. So I want it to be stable in the same area. In the same time, I want to increase the thickness of the uh, area that where I did my phrenectomy and I make the soft tissue quite thin. So after switching, move back to the area and see how everything looks nice and healthy. You see how much keratinized uh, tissue, uh, uh, even on the lingual side, you see you have about two millimeter height uh, on the lingual side and about three to four millimeter on the buccal side of soft tissue. So I know that this side has a thick amount of soft tissue in a buccal direction also in the uh, uh, lingual uh, direction and you can see that how we start the case and how we increase the soft tissue on the uh, buccal side quite thick soft tissue uh, buccally and all keratinized we don't have any kind of uh, mobile uh, soft tissue so i know that the site is quite uh, healthy and is healing very well 
And you can see that how we converted the uh, uh, defect into a bulge of soft tissue, and then the uh, crown was uh, placed at the site. And you can see, look how much of the soft tissue that we created buccally, and it looks as much as the natural teeth. You can still see the uh, connective tissue graft uh, maturing at the site because this is just like after uh, a month and a half from uh, placing the graft is still is still thickening the soft tissue and maturing it and we still have a big amount of uh, soft tissue uh, surrounding the area we have a big amount of papilla also mesial and distal to the uh, implant site if you look at the case here this is how we went through the case you see the amount of the papilla uh, mesial and distal to the uh, implant site and also we can see that how the case look like at the end see quite a big amount of soft tissue cretinized is sealing the site completely and everything look nice and intact and healthy and uh, we had uh, uh, the patient uh, requested to do uh, this kind of uh, crown and that it's placed at the site and everything looks nice and well so uh, what i'm trying to show you here that uh, even if you do something wrong you can uh, manipulate the area and and then correct it but the basic thing that if you plan your case properly at the beginning like place your implant in a good position create enough amount of graft at the site uh, and then if something goes wrong like exposure you can recover the exposure you can re-augment the bone you can re the soft tissue so you can always handle your defect in a way that you can create an optimal result at the end this is how it looks from a start to end. See, this is the site uh, before I grafted the soft tissue. Look at the, if you look at the bottom of the uh, uh, image, you can see the soft tissue was quite thin on the buccal side. Look at the difference, how much thickness we created after that. We created like three to four millimeter on the buccal side. So I know that I have enough uh, uh, keratinized tissue that will seal the site. If you remember the exposed area of the lingual side, look how much soft tissue thickness and uh, uh, keratinized tissue lingual side so i understand that when i have a defect or i have a complication i should not demolish all i did and you have to just uh, uh, deal with the uh, uh, case uh, in steps in order to maintain it and to guide the case to uh, a good healing at the end as you can see here, we can see that uh, the thickness of the soft tissue and also the case, how the case started and how it end at the end. And uh, this is just on follow up and everything looks nice and healthy. And then this is the case if you compare the beginning to end, how we started and how we finished. You can see that uh, a big amount of soft tissue and uh, everything looks nice and healthy at the case and we have a big amount of fixed uh, kind of uh, keratinized tissue not mobile tissue you can see the mucogingival junction is still the picture on the right hand side of the screen the mucogingival junction is still in the correct position we did not compromise the mucogingival junction and everything looked nice and healthy and this is the patient final smile line as you can see the patient has an open bite here because he was uh, having kind of uh, bad habits when he was a small boy and uh, you can see that uh, the tooth is now in place and position uh, the gum is totally covered by the soft tissue but by the uh, lips but in the same time we i understand that the tissue uh, is sealing the site of the implant and everything will stay there for a long time uh, with this uh, picture i would like to uh, reach my uh, end of my presentation i would like to thank you all very much for your attention and now we can go back to the uh, uh dr mina to uh, to discuss uh, any question that you would like to have and uh, go with the questions and answers that you would like to uh, conduct to me at the end of this thank you very much You have a uh, strong presentation to the point, bullet strong. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, if you're doing diphrenectomy, would you uh, stage it and do diphrenectomy before the guided tissue or after? Well, uh, I, I think the mistake I did here that I did the diphrenectomy too close to the flap. I should have gone more to the uh, lip direction. Uh, and uh, I usually, uh, uh, kind of do it uh, in a way that I don't have any uh, uh, cut uh, towards the uh, augmentation side. I have to be parallel to the ridge 
I I think I my incision line was a little bit on an angle uh, when I was uh, releasing the uh, frenum, so that uh, thinned the tissue on the buccal side. Because if you look at the exposure, it's exactly at the site where I did the phrenectomy. The area above it and underneath the phrenectomy uh, was intact. So this created by me uh, holding the blade in the wrong angle. You should actually get the blade always parallel to the ridge not on an angle. I think when I was uh, releasing, I had about uh, 45 degrees angle and that's why it's thin the tissue on the buccal side. Yeah. Um, let, let me know your thoughts on this. 15 years ago, I was just, uh, when I started doing all the implants, I was shadowing uh, this doctor that have been placing implants for more than 30 years. And the thing that I've been seeing very commonly is wide implants causing it to be very challenging to have enough bone and soft tissue around it and then um, recently last few months i hear from dr frank schwartz the president of the dji that the biggest mistake that we've done in implant history is using wide diameter implants what's your thoughts on that do you think the future is going towards more thinner implants to be able to build more soft tissue and bone around it yeah i think uh, i think uh, I, I i remember uh, in the early 90s when i started doing implants uh, it was always uh, the, the wider the better because it says even in the aesthetic zone if you use the wider diameter implant you will have a kind of uh, a good right. image profile which is which proved to be wrong now you see now i always minimize uh, my implant di dimension the i think also it comes back to the fact that the quality of the uh, material of the titanium became more rigid uh, because in the old time the thin thinner the implant or the narrower it's more uh, more uh, like uh, easy to fracture um, and uh, and uh, nowadays the quite thin implant they have more rigidity in them they can take a big uh, uh, force Nowadays, the maximum diameter of the implant I use even in the molar is uh, four millimeter. I don't even go more than that uh, because I don't see the need for uh, more than that. Uh, uh, nowadays, I'm using a kind of a thinner implant more than less, less than three millimeter, which is 2.75. Uh, it's done by uh, GD Implant. It's an Italian company. We actually did a few cases together to see uh, if we can support uh, a full denture implant on 2.75 millimeter full arch implant uh, in, in an elderly patient and uh, so far we did few cases and uh, we have a great success uh, especially when you consider the, the patient occlusion and how uh, old is the patient you see that we get lots of uh, very old patient that needs a full arch implant and they have a very thin bone so we can use this kind of uh, narrow diameter implant which is 2.75 like you use six of them and you can support a full denture in them that the patient uh, has a weak muscles. Uh, you use also uh, a hybrid bread which acrylic teeth. So any um, extra load of force, it will fracture the acrylic and not the implant itself. So there is there is kind of a consideration that can help us using in this diameter implants. And I don't see the use for a very wide diameter implant like uh, 5.5 and 6.5 i think these these implants uh, is getting less and less in use they're not as uh, popular as before yeah and the new architecture of designing the connections and how the energy and the exactly dissipated in the implant yeah. and our implants are getting to be a little bit more submerged so a lot of the studies that were focusing on um, how the bone acts around the edge of the implant is is not valid anymore because the implant is actually submerged. So there is a yeah, difference. You see, in the in the in the old time, we used to think that uh, when you use an implant in uh, that doesn't have a platform switching, you're going to end up having uh, exposure and recession. And we came to know by time this is not the case. This is the case of having a, or creating biological width around the area. And uh, uh, for, for some reason, I never feel good leaving my implant on the bone level. I always like to place my implant deeper. And it was an argument between me and my colleagues always that why you place your implant deeper. And I think when I place my implant deeper, I created enough space to create a nice emerging profile. Even if in a molar or anterior tooth, 
I always do this, place my implant a little bit deeper. I know that the textbook and the lecture used to say three to four millimeters from the cement to amyl junction, but I like to place it more deeper because I, I noticed that when the implant is deeper and you have enough uh, amount of soft tissue, you don't have uh, uh, resorption. And we came to learn later on that this uh, resorption is due to the body trying to uh, defend itself and trying to create biological weights. So if you don't have enough soft tissue, the bone will resorb to allow soft tissue to grow to create biological weights. And this is when the implant is targeting exposure. And we're trying to blame it on the implant design and implant uh, uh, connection and the micro motion. And we used to blame it that the micro motion is too much and creating bacteria and the bacteria and making the resorption of the crystal bone. But this is proved to be wrong because the body is trying to create biological width around the implant neck. It's not the micro motion and it's not the connection. It's more the, the, the biology. Uh, we used to do something against the biology and the body wants to come back to its origin and create enough soft tissue that will protect the bone. It's nothing to do with the connection or the, uh, because many times I use implant to help platform switching and I see there's no bone loss. And we became to know later on because the position and the thickness of soft tissue will allow the bone to be preserved in that area. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's a small part of it is the micro movement and the other part of it is the volume of the tissues on the bone that you're able to, to bring in. Yeah. yeah. So the more tissues, the more bone, the, the more you have to, or you're able to compensate for that because you have a continuous vascularized for the tissues and the bone that you already uh, uh, yeah. raised. Um, if you're getting your connective tissue graft from the palate, um, do you pick and choose from where from the palate you'd like to take it, like more dense one from a little bit more posterior where um, uh, uh, the, the third uh, molar is? Yeah. Or Yes, you see, I usually, uh, uh, like, there is, there, is, there is many things that control where I take the graft from. One thing is the, uh, I, I, I like to work and have a good vision. I like to have good access to the site. I don't want to be working in an area that I'm not uh, comfortable when I take the graft. And also, in the same time, uh, before I take the graft, I like to uh, numb the palate and I like to uh, probe the palate with any uh, probe with a gauge to see the thickness of the tissue. So if I see, because not every patient is identical to the other patient. I know that some textbook tell you if you go more to the uh, posterior area, it's more thicker. If you go to the anterior area, it's less. But I, I actually see that every, every person has a different thickness, even in the same side. So I like to usually uh, 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 numb the patient, put like a, a perioprobe with a, a stopper, like an endostopper net, and just uh, uh, poke the tissue to see till I touch the bone, to see how much thickness I have. If I have a thickness at the side that I can use, I just go for it and I just take it from that side. So it, it, it doesn't really bother me if I'm taking it from posterior or anterior, it doesn't matter, as long as I have enough thickness of the tissue that I have. Perfect. With... Um soft tissue pedicle flaps for dentier, for example. Yeah. How often do you do that? Do you like doing that often or? The, the, the more the medical, for the patient? Yeah, usually usually I do this when I when I have, especially if I have uh, oroantral fistula. This is my first choice always. I have uh, a case uh, on YouTube showing this uh, kind of uh, situation that you take because this kind of area that it doesn't have enough uh, uh, blood supply, especially if you if you have an oral osteo fistula and the and the palate is exposed, uh, there is no uh, blood supply from the site of the perforation. So I want to have an area that bring the blood to the site during the healing, and that's why I always do this when I have uh, oral anterior fistula. I like to close it as well. Also, if I I do a, a, a pedicle flap in an area that I don't see there's enough uh, blood supply if I do just do a correct tissue graft, especially if you have a fully elevated fully elevated kind of a flap. I'd like to uh, do this because I want to make sure that this soft tissue have adequate enough uh, of, of uh, blood coming to the area. One of, one of the uh, uh, factors that I always lecture about when I do any graft, I say to everyone, you should have always blood to the site. This blood is the uh, crucial thing. If you see the site that doesn't have any bleeding, you expect to have a failure. That's why any graft you do, soft tissue, hard tissue, any graft, you have to always make sure that there's blood coming to the site. Because if there's no blood coming to the site, 
make sure that this area will not grow if there is no blood coming to the side. Because if you don't have enough oxygen coming to the cell, you don't have enough blood supply coming to the cell, you don't have nutrition to the cell, You're the cell okay. will die. die. It's as simple as this. Simply, if you do soft tissue or if you do hard tissue, all with the same. Even if you do a graft of the bone, I I I, I read lots of articles that says that it doesn't matter if you don't if you don't uh, decorticate in the posterior uh, mandible. Uh, but I, I I don't believe this because the to rely only on the blood supply coming from the brain ostium, I don't think it's enough. Especially when you put vital tissue, you need blood to come to the side. You need uh, stem cells to come to the side, and the the stem cells are circulating in the blood stream and in the bone marrow area. So that's why I always like to decorticate if you do any graft at the posterior mandible. Bleeding is the important thing and you can only create success if you have blood at the side. This is the ABC of augmentation. You always have to have enough uh, uh, nutrition to the cells. You should have enough oxygen coming to the cells. So always bleeding at the side is very, very important. Beautiful. Uh Hurry technique in comparison to guided tissue regeneration. How often do you go for the autogenous uh, bone uh, blocks with the Hurry technique concept and way of thinking? And uh, how often do you usually uh, guide and build the tissue with the guided uh, tissue regeneration the way you did it before with the, either with the mesh or uh, resorbable membrane? Okay, uh, the 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 Cori technique was created uh, based on uh, the the biology of the bone. There is there is uh, the the concept of the Cori technique. I was actually trained by him, and the concept is that he does the blade to work as a, a source of uh, cells. When you use the blade, it has bone cells. In the same time, this plate act as a space uh, um, um, uh, 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 maintenance area. And that's why when you screw the plate at the Curie technique at the side, you should leave a space between the two plates because these two plates act as a barrier or a space maintenance to the area because the soft tissue will invade the site quickly. So anything that you maintain the area and maintain the space will allow the bone cells to grow at the site. Some areas in the mouse, or when I do bone graft, I use titanium mesh, and then I leave the other area that it has a bone already without any titanium mesh. And I can see that the area where I place my mesh, when I remove it after healing, the bone, because I created a space for the cells to grow, they grow further as long as you give them a space. So a Cori technique is a technique of a GBR. It's, it's a GBR technique. Okay, it's a guided bone regeneration technique, but the technique called a Cori technique because exactly maintaining the area uh, for the bone cells to grow, you stabilize the graft, so the graft is not moving, it's not scattering around, so you're stabilizing the particles to be in the same place. In the same time, the reason he thin the blade uh, when he plays it, because people use the bone block, the block is quite thick. It does not allow the penetration of the blood vessels. And he, he makes the block very, very thin because the thinner the uh, uh, plate, it will allow the blood vessels to penetrate it and allow the blood vessels to come to the site to uh, uh, put the undifferentiated mesenchymal cells to, uh, the, the, to, to release the stem cells from the uh, blood vessels. So this is the concept of that. And if you, the reason I use titanium mesh because it's very similar to the idea. You maintain the space, the holes in the mesh will allow the vascularization, it will allow the blood vessels to grow through it. At the same time, it will block the soft tissue to come closer to the site. So you're creating a space for the bone cells that you placed at the site to grow. Because these bone cells doesn't have the power to push the soft tissue to grow. If they don't have a space, they will not grow. It's as simple as this. And that's why when people use soft uh, um, collagen, uh, a membrane and suture, and you compress the site with the flap, and the uh, collagen membrane doesn't have the strength to hold the tissue away, when you come back to the site and you flap it, there is no bone anymore because you didn't create a space for the sift for the for the bone cells to grow. You you crush the bone cell with the flap and you crushed it with the soft uh, uh, collagen membrane. So the bone cells didn't have a space to grow, so they don't grow. It's as simple as this. That's why you come back to the site, you flap site, you open, you see that you placed lots of bone particles, you placed your collagen membrane, but there is no cells, there is no bone. 
And this is because you did not create a space. It's very important to create a space for the bone cells to grow. No space, they cannot grow. It's as simple as this. Very good point. Uh, with your enormous clinical experience, what's your thoughts on the on the bone ring technique by Dr. Gisenhagen, um, whether it's um, autogenous and you refine it from the patient's uh, own uh, mandible, for example, or uh, if it's an allograft and you just got it, uh, I think um, Boris now have it. What's what's your experience with that and what's your thoughts on that? You see, all, all the bone grafting techniques aiming for the same thing. Uh, you maintain a space, you have an area, you see even, even this bone ring that you buy uh, online, if you look at it, it's very porous. It's not a, a, a closed uh, a block of bone. It's it's lots of pools in the in the in the bone ring, and this is exactly the same because it allows the blood to circulate and vascularize the area. Also, it has an a, 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 a shape that it will maintain the the uh, uh, graft at the side, so it does not disintegrate when you cover it with the flap. So again, it's aiming for the same thing. It maintaining the space. It will allow the blood vessel to penetrate through it. It also it also has osteoinductive and osteoinductive uh, uh, properties, and also it will maintain the uh, bone at the site, and that's why it stabilizes the graft because stabilizing the graft also is an important thing. So when you screw the bone ring with the implant at the site, the bone uh, ring is totally stable. It doesn't have any micro motion, and uh, the stability also is one of the important part in the uh, uh, bone grafting. I haven't used the ring myself, but I know many of my colleagues is using the ring, and I can see exactly what they do. The both the ring with the implant, make sure it's stable, make sure it doesn't uh, move, and also it has a kind of uh, 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 hollow, uh, lots of uh, penetrations in it, and it allows the blood vessel to go through it. So, any kind of bone grafting technique it's always aiming to the same important i call it the four s uh, technique which are the four s rules you have uh, the s number one is the stability the s number two is the space the s number three is the supply of blood and the s number four is the, is the stability of the implant so you always consider these s's when you do any bone graft any material that can give you these properties, it will lead to a uh, successful bone graft. If you use a Curie technique, if you use titanium mesh, if you use the bone ring, if you use reinforced membrane, all the things aim for the same kind of target. And the reason I use a lot of a sticky bone because the sticky bone will provide me with growth factors. It also will help me in creating a stability of the graft. And so the graft is not moving. So it's that's why it helps the uh, bone graft to be successful. Yeah. Uh, what's your thoughts about the 3D printed uh, personalized bone blocks? Personalized. I've seen actually, it's a good idea. And you see, the good thing about it, it gives you the exact dimension of the defect that you want to. Uh, 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 belt. It also gives you uh, uh, places because you have to screw it well. It has to be screwed. Again, you can see it has lots of penetration uh, uh, points for the blood vessels. Uh, you see, every every technique of uh, bone graft always aiming for the same concept of the four S's. This this modified. It's 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 another way of having a space, another way of having osteoinductive osteoinductive area, because you can get it with uh, 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 allogenic bone, so it has the uh, bone allogenic protein, so it will be osteoinductive uh, at the site. It has to be also stabilized because they give you these screw holes where you screw the holes to hold it. So any kind of motion in this kind of uh, graft. Uh, material, it will also lead to uh, uh, necrosis and resorption. At the same time, also you have to make sure that there's a blood, make sure that it's always totally covered. Actually, uh, uh, exposure and uh, total uh, coverage is uh, very crucial when you use any kind of bone grafting technique. That's why uh, releasing uh, the flab really well, make sure that you suture in a very proper way, everything will totally be covered under the uh, the flap. This is very crucial also for the success of any technique that you use. 
you know, you have the scaffold, you have the bone cells, and you have the vascularization that feeds it. Exactly. The main things. And I think we're going to be seeing a lot of uh, new techniques and new materials out there in the future that is just focusing mostly that to simplify it and give us more diversity of uh, uh, of the way of doing things. Um, with the with the implant designs, um, what's what's your thoughts about uh, uh, one piece implants? Are you using one piece implants often or not really anymore? Are we going back towards one piece implant just to uh, decrease the all the problems on the connections? Well, I don't really have any experience with one piece implant, but I think it's a very uh, you are limiting your options. Because if you place one piece implant, you have to know exactly where you're placing it. You have to understand exactly uh, 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 how much of tissue you will have uh, at the site after healing. Because we all know that after healing, the soft tissue will have a shrinkage during the healing. So it's a quite uh, a tricky implant. Uh, so you have to make sure that everything is like measured before you place it. And you have to expect also how much uh, uh, resorption uh, during healing, because we understand that every time we do a flap, we have some, we create some resorption at the site, uh, either by soft tissue or by hard tissue. So all the things have to be calculated in mind, because if you go wrong and uh, the the direction or the amount of abutment uh, is not showing enough or showing too much, it will create a problem for us in the future. But focusing on gaining the value of having a thinner neck around the implants is always more valuable just to get the soft tissue and the bone that we need and bigger. Well, exactly, because you're creating a space. If you have the enough space at the site, you allow the soft tissue. There is a technique that I use always when I create soft tissue around the implant. I, If I want to increase the, you know, I very rarely use now a crystal tissue graft. Very, very, very rare. I've seen many people telling you, I put always a uh, connective tissue graft around my implant to make sure that I think it's soft tissue. I rarely do this, very, very rare. What I usually do if I see that the implant needs a soft tissue to be thickened, I totally cover the implant. And then on the second stage, I go more to the palatal side to create a, 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 a thicker yeah. tissue. Yeah, and I use always very narrow, very, very narrow uh, gingival former. A very large gym former. And then one. Sorry, we got cut off. I think we have a technical problem. Just uh, one minute, we'll try to get back, Dr. Uh, Rashid.
Hello? Yep, yeah, I can see you. Yeah. Are we live? Yes. Perfect. Sorry, my laptop died. No, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> you wake it up again. So that's good. <laughs> you resuscitated. Uh, uh, beautiful lectures, beautiful like beautiful techniques, and uh, your experience is uh, is uh, extremely valuable. How many years have you been doing this again? What exactly? Implants, the whole thing. Twenty something. I, I, I placed my first implant in ninety three. Wow, that's a long time. There is a guy here telling me the surfboard is distracting me. <laughs> Oh, did they? <laughs> Actually, the surfboard is a, is a gift uh, from my friend. It's not really just, uh, just, uh, just to. Is that, uh, a, is that a Chanel logo on a surfboard? Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't use it for surfing. It's just, uh, you know, uh, as a gift from my friend. Yeah. <laughs> it's Dr. Uh, Sitara. Perfect. Yeah, we loved your lecture and we loved your thoughts and. Um, Hopefully we can get you on more often and uh, get you more involved with us. Uh, we always love your work and your experience and, uh, uh, and your final results are always impressive. Um, thank you very much. And uh, we loved having you. Um, give us a few words of encouragement for the GIS. Tell us what you thought, or, like what you think about what we're doing. <laughs> Well, I think it's a great uh, effort because uh, during this time uh, pandemic, everyone is like sitting home. And uh, I was actually, I was uh, quarantined 14 days uh, because at the beginning of this story, I was in Europe. I came back to Dubai. I was asked by the government to be quarantined. Uh, I was lucky uh, to be quarantined by the government at the JW Marriott, a very uh, luxury. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And the, the thought of being sitting in a locked room for 14 days was uh, quite uh, shocking. But because of these webinars and everything, I was very entertained. I was watching all the time colleagues talking. This is when I discovered the uh, Zoom and everything. Yeah, we're trying. We're trying to get it. Um, so it's a great we're effort. Trying it, we're you trying to make it very time. diverse. Yeah, yeah. So we're getting different thoughts and um, uh, very diverse. And we're very excited about it. And Dr. Shaw is. Uh, is enormously active and uh, he's the one that uh, pushed for all this to happen and uh, we can't believe it actually uh, reached where it reached now um I have thank you for uh, uh being with us today and uh, hopefully we'll see you soon live here in la we need to hang out hopefully <laughs> soon hopefully <laughs> sorry for being late because i just finished work and i had to rush home to be online and uh, talk to you no worry we're happy to have you it's uh i think a lot of people enjoy the lecture thank, thank you very much thank you thank you bye bye bye